and welcome. I'm Valerie Paley, Senior Vice President and Sue Ann Weinberg, Director of the Patricia D. Klingenstein Library at the New York Historical Society. I would like to thank Louise Mirror, our President and CEO, Pam Schaffler, Chair of the Board of Trustees, all of our trustees, Joyce B. Cowan, Diane Max, and the late Adam Max, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, along with our Chairman's Council, our members, and our many other generous donors. None of the work of New York Historical is possible without your continued and committed support. Now, as many of you know, we launched the Center for Women's History in early 2017. It is the first initiative of its kind in the nation within the walls of a major museum. Now, even during this challenging time of the COVID-19 pandemic, we remain committed to exploring the lives and legacies of women who have shaped and continue to shape the American experience. Which bring me, brings me to today's conversation, Becoming Notorious, Revisiting the Legends and Legacy of RBG. We'll be presenting a series of conversations and panels, which we will air over the course of our related exhibition, Notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Thank you to the exhibition's lead sponsor, Weill Gottschall and Mangies, and the Weill Philanthropic Committee and Social Responsibility and Foundation team, and the exhibition's major sponsor, Northern Trust. And now I'm delighted and honored to introduce today's extraordinary panel. Shana Knizhnik is a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society Criminal Defense Practice in Manhattan. While a student at NYU Law, she created the notorious RBG Tumblr, a feminist website dedicated to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her lifelong fight for equality and social justice. In 2015, she co-wrote the New York Times bestseller, Notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg with journalist Erin Carmone and was named to Forbes 30 Under 30 in media in 2016. While at NYU, Knizhnik was a articles editor for the NYU Law Review and served on the boards of Outlaw and the Coalition on Law and Representation. After graduating cum laude from NYU Law in 2015, Knizhnik served as a law clerk to the Honorable Dor Dolores Sloboder, judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, and worked as a legal fellow at the ACLU of the District of Columbia. Nishnik holds a bachelor's degree in political science from Columbia University. Melissa Murray is the Frederick I. and Grace Stokes Professor of Law at NYU School of Law, where she teaches constitutional law, family law, criminal law, and reproductive rights and justice. Her writing has appeared in a range of legal and lay publications, including the Harvard Law Review, the Yale Law Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and The Nation. Prior to joining the NYU Law faculty, Murray was the Alexander F. and May T. Morrison Professor of Law at the University of California, Berkeley, where she received the Law School's Rutter Award for Teaching Distinction, the Association of American Law School's Derek A. Bell Award, and from March 2016 to June 2017, served as interim dean of the law school. Murray serves as a legal analyst for MSNBC and is a co-host of Strict Scrutiny, a podcast about the Supreme Court and the legal culture that surrounds it. A graduate of the University of Virginia and Yale Law School, Murray clerked for Sonia Sotomayor, then a judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, and Stephen Underhill of the U.S. District Court for the District of Connecticut. She is a member of the American Law Institute and the New York Bar. Aminatu So is a writer and interviewer. She is the co-author of the New York Times bestselling book, Big Friendship. She hosts the long-running podcast, Call Your Girlfriend, with Anne Friedman. Twice a week, she sends a delightful newsletter called Creme de la Creme. Aminatu lives in Brooklyn. And our moderator, Erin Carmone, is a senior correspondent at New York Magazine, a CNN contributor, and co-author of Notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which spent three months on the Times bestseller list. She's been a national reporter at MSNBC and NBC News, as well as a staff writer at Salon.com and Jezebel.com, covering gender, reproductive rights, and the law. As a contributing writer to the Washington Post's Outlook section, she won a 2018 Mirror Award from the Newhouse School at Syracuse University for her work breaking the story of sexual harassment allegations against Charlie Rose. She speaks frequently across the country on women's leadership and rights. In 2011, she was one of Forbes 30 under 30 in media. 
Welcome, Aminatu, Melissa, Shauna, and Irin. Thank you so much, Valerie, for that introduction. I feel so incredibly lucky one, to be in the company of three women who I have learned so much from over the years, whether working together, interviewing, or as friends. Um, I am also really lucky to get to cheat, kind of, by being both a moderator and kind of a panelist. Um, I always like to be in charge a little bit. Um, and it's, it's always a good time to talk about uh, all of the issues at stake raised by uh, the exhibit, the book, the phenomenon of Notorious RBG, and evermore as uh, the world keeps changing and as we keep getting new information, as we ponder how to make sense of her legacy now that Justice Ginsburg is no longer with us and now that she has been replaced by Amy Coney Barrett. So lots to unpack and we will get to it all, nothing off limits. But I first want to place this in, you know, recent historical context. It is very hard to believe that it was eight years ago uh, that, that the meme of RBG began. Um, in some ways, uh, the world has changed dramatically. In other ways, um, we might argue that Shelby County was still wrongly decided. Um, so I want to open up first to you, Shauna, if you could quickly take us through how this all happened, the first, the, the phenomenon, so then we get into the other stuff. Sure. Thanks, Erin, and thanks, Valerie, for that introduction. Um, Yes, it is quite strange to think back on where we all were eight years ago or over eight years ago. Uh, in June 2013 is when I started the Notorious RBG Tumblr. Uh, it was the day that the Supreme Court issued its decision in Shelby County versus Holder, as you just referenced, Dorin. Uh, in that case, the majority of the Supreme Court in a five to four decision struck down the central provision of the Voting Rights Act, as we know, one of the most important pieces of civil rights legislation in American history. And Justice Ginsburg not only wrote the dissenting opinion in that case, she also announced it, that decision orally from the bench. She had that same week previously dissented from the bench a record number of times, previously in cases involving affirmative action, as well as of employment discrimination. And in that case, Justice Ginsburg essentially called out the majority of the Supreme Court for what it was doing, which was gutting this central piece of legislation that protected uh, people who were historically marginalized Essentially, that provision made it so that counties and states with histories of voting discrimination needed to pre-clear uh, those changes with the federal government in order to make those changes. And the majority of the Supreme Court, written in an opinion by Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, stated that that provision was no longer necessary under a sort of novel constitutional theory, uh, essentially that racism no longer existed. At that point, Barack Obama was president, racism was over. Um, and so we just didn't need that anymore, despite the fact that the Voting Rights Act had been reauthorized time and time again by almost unanimous majorities of, of Congress. And Justice Ginsburg said that getting rid of that provision when it had and was continuing to protect against discriminatory changes to voting laws was like getting rid of your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. And I thought that that just so clearly encapsulated the issue. And I was not alone. There were millions of people across this country, young people in particular, who were paying attention to what the court was doing and who were angry. I was going into my second year of law school at the time, and I decided to sort of create a space on the internet in tribute to Justice Ginsburg's words with that quote from Shelby County as the very first post. And I called it Notorious RBG, which is of course a nod to the late great Notorious B.I.G., a 90s hip hop icon. Um, and of course that pun sort of took off. And, and from there, you know, it was just sort of a, a, an encapsulation of, of a movement of people who were really interested in what the court was doing and interested in Justice Ginsburg's words in dissent. And that's what's really interesting about this entire phenomenon is that 
we can celebrate Justice Ginsburg's legacy, but at the end of the day, what we were doing, what I did with the blog was really about trying to celebrate her in dissent when what she wanted the whole time was to be in the majority. Right, um, in, in defeat, in defeat, to just to underscore your point. Absolutely. Um, I, I mean, I want to, I mean, not to, I want to bring in, sorry, using your friend name. Um, I want to bring in um, your perspective, both because you created a meme at the time, and also because I consider you to be one of the, like the sharpest observers on the planet of many things, including internet culture. So can you place it into context in terms of like, it's hard to believe also that the memes were really fresh around then too, like they were, I don't know, to tell me if I'm wrong, but it feels like it was also a different moment in terms of both feminism and the internet. I'm curious how you see it. I mean, you said eight years ago and it sent a chill down my spine <laughs> because I just, you know, I think that what is really, what really has happened here is that we all have changed. It's true that the culture has changed, but we also have changed. Um, and eight years is a long time and politically it's a thousand years. I think that, um, you know, when I think of that time, there are a couple of things that are happening. Um, from the moment that Barack Obama was elected, this, you know, like for a lot of us, especially if you were young, um, there was this feeling of like, oh, the change has come and it's going to be completely new, which is, you know, like youthful people often feel that way. People who are more seasoned have had, um, they have had waves of hope similar-ish to Barack Obama. And so I think that there was something there for those of us who were young with, that had lived through, you know, the Bush elections, we had, you know, like, we had seen John Kerry go down the tubes. It was like Barack Obama felt so, you know, we're like the light has come in the darkness. And the minute that he gets elected, you realize like, oh no, the political machine does what the political machine does and it, it doesn't matter. And there was a huge disconnect between feeling that you had a Democrat in office and yet here were all of our values being under siege. I think that for a lot of, um, especially young people, that was something that was really hard to understand. And so that is one dynamic that's happening. The other dynamic I think that's happening is that, especially in the second term, we are dealing with a lot of intellectual dishonesty from the right and the Obama administration and the Democratic Party in general did not handle that well, where we were kowtowing to every, just every whim that they had, you know, and it was like, we have to keep the peace and we have to be in the middle. And I think that when, you know, these, these dissents that Shauna is describing, that I am not a lawyer. I obviously, I'm a, I am a very politically minded person. The court is not an institution that traditionally I had paid a lot of attention to. The way that the court kind of comes into my media diet really is when, you know, when there are big decisions that come, but I have to be honest that I, you know, I could name all of the justices, but I could not really have told you anything specific to them because that was not my area of interest. And, um, you know, Sorry to the lawyers, the Supreme Court, <laughs> okay, not so always the second. What, what made you want to then, in this particular moment, you're talking about the kind of second term disillusionment, the rights dishonesty. Yeah, uh, it's, it's- What I mean, made you want to mean? I think that what happened is that we are in this moment where we are watching our president just really kind of give in to, to bullies all day. We are, you, we are watching our politics just turn into this there was a bit of madness in the air where we were always, it felt like being gaslit, that you always had to, we had to find moderation. And here's this woman who is essentially saying like, pardon my English, like this is bullshit. She was fed up. And I think that it really, the dissents were withering, you know? And I think that there was something about that righteous anger that matched up so immediately to the, the anger and the resistance and the just, the, the disconnects that we were all feeling that just, you know, I, you cannot make up that, <laughs> that kind of, um, that kind of connection. The other thing that I think is going on is that these dissents don't live in a vacuum. We had, you know, we, we have the Shelby County dissent. We have the, the Abigail Fisher dissent from my alma mater at UT, which is such a, you know, like, I still think of that girl and I'm like, I, like, you should not be admitted to any university in the world. Um, I think about like Hartart, I think about you know, like the Wendy Williams filibustering, it's all of these things happen like in very quick succession. And, you know, the great thing about the internet is that we all get to hang out together, but we also get to be angry together and we get to be happy together and we do influence each other. And I think that for me, Shelby County was the first time that I looked at this woman. I had known about 
Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I, you know, I was, I was a fan, if you can say that you were a fan. I'm like, great body of work. But there was something really powerful about watching this diminutive, you know, I would say like a, this smaller person, traditionally like older women in our society are very much like shunted to the side. We, we do not have good models of female strength and female ambition. And here is this person saying, this is bullshit. And it was electrifying and just watching that, you know, and, um, and it was such a righteous kind of anger. And it was also the truth. What was really missing in those early Obama years, I think we all felt gaslit that we, we could never tell the truth or the truth was being distorted. And here's this person just saying, here are our values. And I think that, um, you know, for me, well, that for meme those was- familiar, Sorry to interrupt, for, for those who aren't yeah. familiar, tell us about what you then, what you and Frank made. I, yeah, so my friend Frank and I, who was a designer, we had been texting through, you know, this like anger that we were having. And we were both like very visual oriented person, very visual oriented people. And I think that it's also not, um, it is, uh, it, this is all also possible because Tumblr was a visual platform that was like very popular at the time. Um, you know, if TikTok had been the platform of choice, maybe they would have been videos. Maybe you had to find a way to share the thing that you were saying. And we decided to juxtapose an image of the justice wearing uh, a Basquiat crown, which is again, an homage to hip hop. There's something so absurd and silly about that. We were like, oh, this, this lady participates, you know, but she is gangster. I'm like, nobody else is gangster here. The, the, the justice is the only gangster here. And we had these, you know, these slogans that we put and one of them was, you know, there's no truth without Ruth and where you can't tell the truth without Ruth. And it was an inside joke, an inside meme that immediately took off. And it's not because it was a great design or because we were primed it for virality. And, you know, and, and it's, it's not a surprise that the blog was happening. We were not the only people in our corner of the internet tinkering with memes. And you are right that, you know, memes today have gotten a lot more sophisticated. They are, it's, you know, they're, they're dangerous in some corners of politics and other corner, corners of politics, they're great. But in this moment, it was really, I think for a lot of young people, it's like, what is the language that we have? And what are the means that we have to communicate with each other? And, you know, our generation did not invent visual language around uh, politics. We did not invent mobilizing around a person that you care about. I just think that it was a perfect confluence of things. And it really is, it really speaks to a culture that obscures older women because our, you know, the, the biggest, you know, like um, most powerful um, champion of American jurisprudence is this tiny woman. And that is something that to me, I think really spoke to a lot of people and, you know, and memes are really about having fun and about, you know, doing something silly, but it really was gallows humor at the time. Like they were, they were really, really, really dark times and you needed to find a way to find your people. So I think in a way, a lot of these memes were dog whistles, you know, where you were trying to find your people. It's like, who is on the level? Who is listening? Who can I trust? And, you know, and also this is how... Yeah, this is how feminist history is made, is we have to be our own archivist and we have to be our own researchers and we have to be our own artists. And again, that is because we live in a culture that traditionally does not celebrate a woman who is, you know, that, that looks like Ruth Bader Ginsburg being a very powerful person. And I think that that is, a, a, the confluence of all of those things really created an electric moment. That's beautifully put. Melissa, for you, like, my perception of you is somebody who is both obviously brilliant on the lawn, but really engaged in pop culture in a way that perhaps some people in the legal academy would consider not their thing, um, which is one reason why I was very excited that you might join. The Meghan Markle behind me, the Meghan Markle mask behind <laughs> yeah, me. It's a behind you. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and I think you, um, you, you dwell in all of those spaces so brilliantly. So I'm wondering, like, since we're in the time machine mode right now, um, what was it like for you uh, as an academic, as, a, as an attorney, as a feminist, um, assuming that's the word that you prefer, um, what was your reaction to all of this? So you know, it was electrifying when it happened for all of the reasons that ha have been said. I mean, you know, it's hard to think of those Obama times as sort of dark times because, you know, it got darker. Um, it's getting darker. And, and so like maybe we'll look back on those like it was still pretty great then. But at the time, I, I remember um, Shelby County was really a shot across the bow. I mean, to dismantle 
such a pivotal aspect of the Voting Rights Act was truly, truly monumental. And to do it on the ground that people of color had advanced so significantly, they were voting in record numbers. And, and it was like, yes, all of that was because the Voting Rights Act worked and, and is working. And it was really the, the clarity of her call to like, like this is gaslighting, like this it was amazing. Uh, but it wasn't surprising per se, because she had been dissenting. Like this was a really interesting period um, from about 2005 until 2009, she was the only woman on the court. This was the sort of interregnum between when Sandra Day O'Connor departed and was replaced by Justice Alito and the time when Justice Souter departed and then was replaced by Justice Sotomayor. And you know, when she came to NYU once, she noted that during that period, there she was, this, this little woman amidst what she called these very well-fed men. <laughs> and I imagine it was incredibly lonely for her in a lot of ways. I think she and Justice O'Connor, although they were quite different in temperament and in sensibilities, um, they, they had a kind of sort of quiet sorority, I think, just by being the only two women on that court. And, and then she was alone. And during that period when she was alone, she really had to take it to her colleagues on a number of issues. There was that case with Savannah Redding, the young girl who was strip searched um, because her principal or vice principal suspected that she had contraband or aspirin or something on her person. And it was Justice Ginsburg who was incensed at the tenor of oral arguments where the justices seemed to be yucking it up about the prospect of a, a girl being strip searched. And she was the one who later said in an interview, you have no idea what it's like to be a pre-adolescent girl and to be strip searched at school. And so, you know, I think she took that period very seriously. And that was when I think you really began to see her kind of showing out in a very specific and um, pronounced way. I mean, this was the time when she read her Lily Ledbetter dissent from the bench, this, you know, and she was, again, I think speaking directly to Justice Alito who had written for the majority, you have no idea what it is like to be a woman in a predominantly male workplace and how you find out that you are being discriminated. It, it's not this flood of information. It's these slow trickles that you continually cobble together until you finally have a portrait of what's being done to you. And only a woman in that position would know that. Of course, you don't know that. You are among these eight very well-fed men. And I, I think that was sort of the origin of this vein of anger that ultimately really catalyzed in Shelby County. Yeah, and I always thought that I agree that that period of her life was really radicalizing. Um, I think also that in the Savannah Redding case, when I interviewed Justice Ginsburg in 2015, she mentioned it as an example in which she had actually changed her colleague's mind. Um, you know, in the end, there it was a, a complex decision. You could explain it better than me, but ultimately, uh, although oral argument was really disrespectful and seemed to be sympathetic to the school, that was not the ruling. Um, but that said, it intensifies along the way. To me, I think when Sandra Day O'Connor gets replaced by Samuel Alito, I think it starts with Bush v. Gore and her being the only uh, woman on the court, and then it steadily accelerates. And we haven't mentioned yet that she would put on a dissenting collar, a, a banana Republican dissenting collar. And so from my perspective, everything that you are talking about falls under a conscious move by Justice Ginsburg to speak to the public that worked, that she was trying to reach out beyond to the court's walls and beyond the legal academy. Melissa, you were going to say something. No, I think that's right. Um, legal scholars like Lonnie Guineer and Gerald Torres call this demos prudence. Um, and you know, I think Justice Ginsburg really perfected it during that last quarter of her time on the court. Um, part of it was reading those decisions from the bench, part of it was sort of the costume and the theater of the dissent collar, all of the collars mm -hmm. really, that really sort of got the public thinking. But I, I do think it was the meme culture where she saw this opening to really intervene with the public in a way that she hadn't before and to do so on terms that ironically had been done remarkably well by her counterpart on the right, Justice Scalia, for, you know, for years through the 1980s and 1990s, he had been the sort of standard bearer of the conservative legal movement and had gone to the law schools, preached to the law schools. He wrote those opinions with their snark and their invective for law students to pick up on it and to develop this cadre 
of conservative soldiers who would be foot soldiers in the movement going forward. And I think she saw this pop cultural opening as a way for her to begin to speak to a whole generation of young lawyers that previously had been less accessible to her and certainly less accessible to the court. So it wasn't just the tote bags, it wasn't just you know the memes, but this opportunity to seed and cultivate a new generation of progressive legal warriors who understood the truth as she knew it and as she wanted to tell it. And do you think that happened? Do you think that she accomplished that? I think that's a brilliant analysis, but did, did it work? I think it's still in progress and, and I think we're going to see it. You know, Justice Scalia was aided, it had a major assist in the creation and development of the Federalist Society. I don't know that Justice Ginsburg had quite the same apparatus behind her. Massive um, but, donations as well. <laughs> massive dark money donations, all of the things. I'm not sure she had all of those, but I think at a grassroots popular level, she vastly exceeded him in terms of her impact on the public consciousness. Um, you know, he was very much trying to intervene in a particular facet of culture, and that was legal culture, and specifically elite legal culture. Um, I think she sort of managed to canvas a broader range. I don't know if that is the most effective way to go about it, um, but it certainly does make her message, I think, more durable. And I think we're seeing some of that now in these fights over abortion, people invoking her name and her legacy and honestly thinking about who has replaced her and what that means at a time like this. Yeah, and there's a lot more to say about that, but I, I just briefly wanna say that when, you know, to, to describe briefly my role in this, when I was approached by my former boss, Anna Holmes, uh, Jezebel, um, and asked if I wanted to team up with Shauna to work on a book about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but it had to come out really quickly. And I don't think, that the publisher expected that there would, you know, God bless our editor, but I don't think they expected there would be many, very many words in it. They really thought it would be like a collection of memes. But Sean and I got together and thought of it as an opportunity. I am a journalist. She was a law student, is now a lawyer, as an opportunity to take that energy and that anger and try to deepen the conversation um, around everything that she was dissenting about, everything that she had done to date. And I think, you know, the spontaneous nature of this. It's hard to feel that now because now there are unending, you know, tote bags and like we we see merch all the time that we feel like crosses a line. Um, but for us, it was like, oh, well, now we get to geek out in the archives, and you know, we had uh, her former clerks, and we had um, Janae Nelson from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund annotate the dissents. We had we thought of it as an opportunity to kind of um, put RBG in the broader context of what she'd been doing, and tell the story of her as a person, um, which, you know, for anyone watching this, you probably know the beautiful marriage, the tragic loss of her mother, all of these human elements that Shauna and I tried to get out there, I think, um, are also part of the reason that people connected with it. And so yeah. I'm wondering, you know, by necessity, by definition, a meme flattens, right? And if you make, if you make, we wrote a book about a woman, her name is in the title, as much as we wanted to put her in the context of social movements. And she was not a saint, she was a human being, but nonetheless, I, I think if we had said that this was a book just about the feminist legal movement, people would not have connected to it in the way that if they had seen that face and the crown. Um, and then the second thing that I wanna bring up for our conversation is that Amina, you with the Basquiat crown, um, RBG with the notorious RBG reference, um, these are both obviously references from hip hop that are deployed on behalf of a white woman. Now, in the beginning, I think it's just reading back what you were saying, it was a joke, it was tongue in cheek, it wasn't really fully thought through. It was, a, it was like a dashed off thing, but it obviously really resonated. Um, and Shauna and I both, you know, we went to the notorious B.I.G.'s estate, asked for permission to quote the lyrics, compensated them, um, have the blessing of his son. But nonetheless, these are public cultural um, valences that, that didn't belong to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So how do we think about one, the way that a meme might flatten a person for better or for worse? And how do we think now about whether, you know, or, or, or how to, how to, um, yeah, how do we think about the fact that these were hip hop icons that didn't necessarily, as much as RBG liked to say we're both from Brooklyn, didn't necessarily belong to her or belong to the original context? Like, is this just a mashup? Is it cultural appropriation? 
And this is such a good question because it is complicated. When Frank and I created that, um, our version of our image, we did actually put a lot of thought into it. Like we, um, it was a very conscious decision. Like I remember even fighting with him about where the placement mm -hmm. of the crown would be. We were, um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we both come from design culture. So we knew what we were doing and, um, you know, and we're both people of color. I'm black and Frank is Asian, but we, um, that reference was really important to us. I think that when, you know, I, I think that this question is very, um, it depends where you sit on the, on, on the racial continuum. And I think it also, it all, like this thing that you were saying about internet culture flattening everything is true. It's like, um, all of these memes are born out of a very primal fast reaction. And that is not to say that one should not be, um, you know, really considerate and careful about how they choose their words. But I think that as the internet is evolving, every single one of us is learning that you can have one intention and then, you know, it's like 10 people care about it and it's different, 100 people care about it, it's different, 100 million people care about it and no longer belongs to you. And so that is a, you know, and Arun, I actually want to connect to this question back to what you were saying about your book, because I do think that your book is such an important part of tying all of these different pieces of the meme together because people think that, you know, when, when, when Frank and I made that meme, of course it was to be funny, but we are, you know, like, I mean, we are thoughtful people who knew what we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, when, Sean I, yeah, when Shauna is making that Tumblr, it is also a very careful choice. And what I was saying earlier about being a feminist, like having to be our own archivist and our own researchers, this is what I'm talking about. There is a version of your book that gets sold, that comes out, and it's literally a coloring book. That's the first book that comes out, and it doesn't do as well at whatever. The reason that your book resonated truly is like, you two are both wonderful people, you did the work and the research, but you connected the dots to what everyone was doing. Like, you know, it's like you start with, you read the descent, you go online and you Google this person and you go, oh, I've always cared about the, Barack Obama signed the Lily Ledbetter Pay Act. That was the first bill that he signed. I've always, I knew the story of Lily Ledbetter. I did not know how, how Ruth Bader Ginsburg was connected to that story. You are someone who donates money to the ACLU. You maybe do not know that Ruth Bader Ginsburg has been engaged in this process of creating things. I think that, you know, and I, I really want to speak for those of us who are not academics and we are not journalists and we are not legal minds that there is something about that that is very radicalizing, you know, where you you start to understand that history has been unfolding under your nose this whole time and that Justice Alito gets all of the coverage. And meanwhile, here is the other lady next to him and she's been doing the work. And I think that a thing about Ruth Bader Ginsburg that's so clear to go back to what Melissa was saying, you know, I, I hear you on the fact that like, maybe she did not leave this robust, um, you know, like kind of legal, um, legal institution behind. But I do think that culturally what she did was very important because that, the, that like, you know, the theater that she was engaged in and clearly she was a mastermind PR. It's like everyone talks about Meghan Markle doing shadow PR. I'm like, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has been in shadow PR since day one. She was waiting for her moment. Even the outfit that she chose to wear for her confirmation and the way that she Appro you know, like she approached Bill Clinton and all of those men, that was, she had yeah. been doing it. There were just not enough people to care. The internet did not exist. We could not all find each other. We have all women who cared about this stuff and people who care about this stuff always existed, but she has been playing a long game. You know, she's been playing an incredibly long game her entire career. Even thinking about someone who is just, at, I cannot imagine having nine colleagues only, like eight colleagues only. There's nine of you. Like the, the scenery almost never changes. There's not that ton of turnover. You're stuck with these people forever. There are these really quiet, painful years and she puts her nose to the ground and she's working. It's the same. She's been engaged in the project of her life has been really bringing these issues to, to light. And I think that again, for those of us who are like clear civilians, there's something about it that is really inspiring. And there's something about it that makes you think oh, maybe I'm not getting the full story here. You know, maybe there's just so much I don't know. And I know that we're gonna get into the documentary later, but a reaction that I get a lot from young people was this just sense of excitement. You know, that there had always been this undercover kind of like very radical person just hiding here. And I think that like, you know, the expressions for, um, 
for women, the superheroes that you have are always fictional. It's like, okay, Wonder Woman is who you should care about. It's like this other person on a stat, like they're never real people. And I think that there was something just, again, like I keep saying the word electrifying because it really was like lightning striking in a bunch of different places at the same time. But the reason that she was able to ride the wave of the meme is not because she learned PR or she learned you know, how to do that in five minutes. She had quietly been doing all of this work and this is still America. If you work hard and you, know, you get lucky and the spotlight shines on you, you might, really, you might really get to ride the rocket ship. And I think that that, happened, that was the same thing that happened with this meme that catapulted her into this other stratosphere, but she had been doing that work all along. I don't think that it's, um, I don't think that it's, uh, I don't think that that's lost on anybody who was engaged in the meme, you know, and, and some of us definitely got summoned into her office to, to explain what was going on. Shauna, I think you remember going to this 8.30, most boring tort, <laughs> maritime tort, like, I still don't even know what torts are. I do not care. Thank you, McDonald's coffee, like, <laughs> coffee case. I remember going to this thing and I was like, wow, why couldn't she, argument. Not- the word I was like, why could she not have summoned us to a sexier argument? And literally I will confess that I fell asleep for five minutes because I, t- I flew from San Francisco. I fell asleep for five minutes and somebody had to wake me up and yelled at me. They were like, you cannot sleep here. I'm like, this is so boring. I was like, some of these justices are asleep. I won't name names. I was like, Clarence Thomas has not opened his eyes in hours. Like, this is so boring. And we go into her office and she's really like, can you explain to me this, this meme? Like she was very curious about it. Clearly a little uncomfortable, I will say in the beginning, but obvious, you know, and also like kind of enjoying it. But I think that she, no, I don't, I think nobody was more surprised than her that she had finally connected with the public she was trying to connect with all along. And it didn't happen because of anything that she'd like some Machiavellian plan that she had. It really kind of accidentally happened. and. It was fun to watch her finally embrace it later, but I, will, I think that in the beginning it was very uncomfortable because it was very uncontrollable, you know, for her, but she saw that opportunity. Well, and I, I don't think she ever sought out the spotlight, which is so interesting mm-hmm. about her in, in that she, it, later in life she became this icon, sort of despite the fact that, although she had, as I mean, as I mean not to mention, um, you know, was always very interested in fashion and, and looked a part that sort of uh, by today's standards, we're all very interested in, in women in power that are you know, in fashion as not being uh, in opposition to serious business. But I think for a long time, and even still it's seen as frivolous in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. but she wasn't someone who necessarily wanted to be that icon. She just did the work as Minato said, uh, and she'd been doing that work for pretty much her entire life and was sort of not someone who even sought to be a radical, but was kind of pushed into that role by the world around her, by the discrimination that she herself faced, by her students who taught her about sort of what the women's movement and feminism really was. Um, You know, going back to Arin's question about uh, sort of the meme and how it flattens things. And I think that that's absolutely true to a certain extent. I, I did start this Tumblr, with, with this title, I also wanted in the, in the Tumblr and also with our book to create something that wasn't just a meme, that was actually substantive as well as fun. And I think, I mean, not to mention the idea that, you know, memes are sort of an entree point. If you are interested in something, you might see a meme and think, okay, well, what's that about? What, what, who, who is this person? Can I learn more about it? And so the, the Tumblr and the book, and hopefully, you know, in this exhibition as well, are an opportunity for people, not just legal scholars, not just lawyers or law students, but anyone who is interested in what is a co-equal branch of the United States government and one of the most powerful institutions who's interested in what is actually happening. And as Erin mentioned, you know, with RBG's oral dissent, she was speaking to the public. And so we were all sort of listening and I think that the ways in which we tried to, and I tried with the Tumblr originally to strike that balance is not easy to do. And as I mean, like you said, on the internet, some things are just not out, you know, in your control once things become really popular, but her work speaks for itself. And I think that's what really speaks to why she was, she's continued to be so resonant is because her life's work in sort of changing the face of American law as it relates to gender discrimination in particular 
is something that I think not a lot of people knew about before her story became as popular as it did. Mm -hmm. um, and I even didn't know about as someone who was in law school. I knew that she was you know, the second Supreme Court, the second woman on the Supreme Court. Uh, I knew that she was appointed by Bill Clinton, but it wasn't until I took constitutional law that I learned that she actually was a litigator at the ACLU and actually was arguing before the Supreme Court in some of the most important mm -hmm. cases that established um, the fact that the 14th Amendment protects against gender discrimination as well as racial discrimination. I didn't even know these things as someone who had you know education and was interested in, in in all of this, and so what I was trying to do was kind of bring that story to a larger audience, and especially as we mentioned, sort of this is the early 2010s. I think internet feminism had only just recently become something that was actually cool and not just seen as um, I don't know um, militant people who hate men, um, although that's perfectly reasonable what? as well. Change? What? <laughs> Wait, um, is this a anti-anti-men? <laughs> no, like, no, like I said, I, I think- no. but, but you're right. Okay, but I do think it is important to view it in the context of now there is so much feminist content um, on the internet, but- Right, it's seen as cliche, like yeah. the idea that being now a feminist- Now it's considered cliche, but before it was sort of something that everybody was seeking out that, that, that they were, hungry for. And yeah, I want to say something though, to like not sidestep your question about race earlier is that this is part of this conversation, right? Is that hip hop culture is global culture. I think that we can all agree that black people are extremely generous with our culture. And we, you know, there, um, there, there is a spirit there of like, you, you know what hip hop culture is and we want it to be embraced everywhere. And in some sense that is fair and generous. And I totally understand why you know, Notorious RBG has a, it has a ring that nothing else will have. It's like, what were you going to do? The powerful RBG, the, the amazing mm -hmm. RBG, th these things do not resonate the same. And I, and I really mean it when I say that, like, you know, those dissents were gangsta. I was like, she, like, what? Like, here is, well, here is, you look like you wanted to jump in. I want to hear from you on this. Oh. Well, you know, I think one thing has to be said, like, she was not a radical. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is true that some of the things that she was arguing were things that have not been accepted by the court, like as an advocate, um, you know, the idea that the 14th Amendment, which does not speak of women, actually encompasses protections against gender based discrimination. Um, that was ra that was different. Um, I don't know that it was necessarily radical, especially in line with the civil rights movement and the understanding of race that and how they were trying to sort of make analogies from race. But I don't know that it's fair to necessarily call her a radical. Um, I think one of the reasons why she hit in the way that she did in 2013 was because the court had become so conservative, right? Um, so I don't know that it's about her being a radical, it's about her reflecting a kind of moderate left sensibility that was very much in line with where the public was, but the court had drifted and, and had left her behind to some degree. And that I think also both explained why she was speaking up, but also why it resonated beyond one first street. And then I think it's also worth thinking about, um, this is a very petite, wealthy white woman who's able to make this kind of intervention. Um, Justice Sotomayor has been on the court since 2009, has written some searing, searing dissents, mm -hmm. and has really taken the public aspect of being a justice to heart in, in terms of going to underserved communities, talking about what the court does, talking about why it is meaningful in the lives of people in those communities. And there's not a single tote bag with her name on it. And I can't help but think that's not just about a moment in popular culture, but um, also about you know the kind of resistance in some vein in, in our society to women of color when they speak out in particular ways. I think, I, I think that's a really- I think we will have sort of mayor tote bags. I think my gentle pushback there, like honestly, is I agree with you mostly. I was like, I think that there is a, you know, there is a, like pop culturally at least, there is a body of work that is building about her. But I think that you cannot understate how much of this notorious RBG meme also was that this woman had just had like an entire life and body of work behind her. There was just so much 
you know, there was, there was a lot to deal with here, but I agree with you about, you know, it's like, it is easier to view a, a white woman who says something, you know, like a kind, and, and when I call her a liberal, I think I, when I call her a radical, I do not mean that in the context of the court, I really mean it in the context of the politics that we were in. She was saying things that we were dying to hear Barack Obama say, would not say them. We were dying to hear Joe Biden say them, would not say them. Our media was not saying them. And it was frankly a shock to the system to hear that kind of talk come from the court, an institution that is usually, again, from as a member of the public, this is not where you get the spicy talk, usually. The spicy talk comes from somewhere else. But and to, it's also, I mean, it is a voting rights case that she mm -hmm. makes this, you know, very profound statement. What? Imagine if Justice Sotomayor, who was also on the court at that time, had written that opinion, like throwing Eat out- alive. Would get eaten alive, different well, and I And I think, you know, Melissa, I interviewed you for my profile, Justice Sotomayor. I think you make really important points. And one of the uh, former clerks that I interviewed talks about how in some way, and this is this is a subtle point, but that that underscores what you're saying, it, that Justice Sotomayor was expected yes. to do to do the resistance voice on the court, mm -hmm. and thus it was sort of I think as a journalist I can say that uh, journalists are always looking for the surprise, the contrast, the conflict. I think and the way in which that operates right. in this context is to erase or diminish Justice Sotomayor's voice because it's more surprising for the white woman to- you know, it, it is more of a man bites dog story yeah. to have yeah. this wealthy white grandmother be the voice of- Married, heterosexual. Yeah. This, yeah. She, and, and I think that that is something that, that you, you know, in the history of her work, she benefited from too, because, mm -hmm. and especially being somebody who was married, who had children, although she was discriminated against uh, for being a mother many times, I think it also helped assuage fears of, oh, this radical feminist. And I think also, Melissa, I take your point about her being a moderate liberal, but I also think maybe what we're doing is we need to separate um, the, the content of what she was saying and the, how she chose to say it. And I think the way she chose to use her voice was what people were responding to. Mm -hmm. um, we only have five minutes left. So I just wanna make sure we, we talk about some of the recent stuff that came out that's very related to what we're talking about here. Um, Katie Couric in her book, apparently have not read it, but um, has reported that RBG made fuller comments about Colin Kaepernick's protest um, in an interview in 2016 that Katie Couric chose not to publish the entirety of. Um, they, they basically, I believe that it's, it's something about um, ignorance of the decent life that the government gave them. I'm, I'm gonna mangle the paraphrase, but to, I found these comments to be disturbing and racist. Um, I previously found the comments that she apologized for about Colin Kaepernick to be misguided, wrong, uh, disrespectful to him, disrespectful to the content of the protest. Um, she's obviously no longer with us. And so and in five minutes, I don't know if we can totally get into what it means that she's been replaced by Amy Coney Barrett, um, but, but we have to acknowledge it. So how do we now, you know, acknowledging all of her contributions, acknowledging that she's a human being with mistakes, uh, who makes mistakes, um, but also acknowledging that, you know, to have an entire exhibition, an entire book about a woman does then set her up as somebody who we admire, that so many of us are so desperate to, to hear the story of, of a person who, who changed the world, who used their power for good. Um, so how do we, beyond just saying, you know, that's racist, that's wrong, how do we now think about information like this, some of which we might have had before, some of which is new? I mean, I want to say quickly that one of the problems of internet culture, which this meme is born on the internet, is that it forces people into stan culture, where you have to be like, I'm team this and I'm team that. Mm -hmm. There is a real flattening also of how do you think about people? Um, the Kaepernick comics were, it's, they were very disappointing, but for all of the reasons that we've mentioned, are you surprised? You know, like, mm -hmm. of course she is capable of this of, kind of- Parts of it, yes, parts of it, no. Just just in terms I mean, of- like, as a person about right. Like she definitely only hired one black clerk, right? So no, that's exactly. that sense. Exactly. The 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 receipts are speaking for themselves. She did not she did not have a ton of contact in her professional. She did not hire a lot of black people. She said this very ignorant thing that a lot of you know a lot of other people say that we don't agree with. So it was that. But I think that what I find disturbing in general is that there is not a way to talk about someone and say here are these massive contributions that she has made, but this person is also a human being who is capable of disappointing you. Like, 
elevating someone and having a museum exhibit about them or doing this documentary, I think to me does not exonerate any of us from critically thinking about who they are. We are all products of our many environments and all of the inputs that we get. And again, you know, as Melissa has pointed out, she is a wealthy, white, like very resourced person. And so if you just think about it that way, I was like, this is, this, these are the things that, this is the friction we have in our culture all the time. I think that for me and my work, I am more interested in complicating people's understanding. I was like, all of these things can be true at the same time. It is true that she like changed you know, she is a massive, like, she is like a, she is someone who was like a massive legal mind. And it was really important that she was here, but also she is still someone who is a human being like all of us. And we can think about that in a way I think that is, is complicated. And I think, you know, is, is something that like is meaningful because what I do not want to fall in the trap of is elevating someone's work and saying, okay, great. They are completely exempt. <laughs> like we don't have to think about them critically at all. Like I, you know, we should have critical thoughts about every single person that is a Supreme Court justice. And unfortunately, you know, I think that like, because a lot of this is born on the internet there, a lot of that conversation does not happen at the same time that we are praising them. And it really sets you up for a kind of like, do you like this person or not? And I know that that sounds really silly, but it, as, as someone who observes those dynamics, it really, I am really worried about that. Yeah, I, I think it's um, right after her passing, there was a lot of discussion of this. And I, I don't know how entirely fair it is. I, I think the record on clerk hiring is clear and it is regrettable. Um, I think to Aminatu's point, um, it would have been better to actually surface this during the time she was alive because, you know, while she was in the throes of the notorious RBG meme would have been the perfect time to correct the record and there would have been considerable pressure mm -hmm. on her to do so. And that would have been a great time to issue some criticism of her on that point. Uh, but I think that this, you know, the move to sort of cancel her or to cancel this aspect of her legacy, I think misses this is complicated and there's lots in here like she's a feminist on the one hand but her brand of feminism is one that i think redounds to the benefit of women of color you know her strategy for litigating these cases with the aclu was to put men gender bending men men who were raising their children men who were taking care of their widowed mothers um those were her litigants and she was making a point that gender discrimination didn't just conscribe women, it also confined men in particular gender roles. And I think that actually worked to the benefit of many women of color who often defied traditional gender norms in the makeup of their households because they were often the ones who were breadwinners because of uneven employment prospects for men of color or whatnot. And so I, I don't know if she intended it that way, but women of color certainly benefited from the fact that her jurisprudence and her advocacy really sort of sought to shake things up and to shake up the traditional division of labor in the home. As a litigator, she argued against forced sterilization in the South, which was a massive problem that continues to be overlooked. And part, part of her argument was that it was sick and that it was racist. I mean, that was part of her constitutional she argument. She saw it as a form of reproductive rights. Reproductive rights was not just about whether you could terminate a pregnancy. It was about people deciding that you were not going to be able to reproduce and, and to do so in a, a clearly racist fashion. So, I mean, I, I think there is a longer arc here and the sort of immediate flashpoints of the clerk record, Colin Kaepernick just doesn't capture a life that is both flawed and full. That's beautifully put. Um, I, I think that since we are out of time, I'm going to let you have the last word on that. Um, I think it's incredibly nuanced. I do want to mention actually that if you visit the New York Historical Society exhibit or if you read our book, you can also learn of RBG's friendship with Polly Murray. Um, I'm going to be moderating a, a panel with the filmmakers and some of the, the guests um, in the Polly Murray documentary. My name is Polly Murray, which everybody should see. RBG is interviewed in it. Um, and of course, RBG famously gave credit to Polly Murray's ideas, which were core uh, to all the litigation that she did at the ACLU in the 1970s against gender discrimination. So important to always give credit and uh, important for all of us to learn the histories that we may not have been told. Thank you so much uh, to all of you for this conversation. I am deeply appreciative to have been part of it. Thanks, Thank Ren. you. So uh, we have unfortunately run out of time. I want to thank Shana Nisnik, Melissa Murray, Aminato So, and Erin Carmon for being with us today. 
Now, please sign up for our mailing list and follow us at nyhistory.org to get the latest on upcoming salons like this one. Erin's and Shauna's book, Notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, is now available online for purchase at our NY History store. Finally, the New York Historical Society is currently open on Wednesdays through Sunday. You can reserve your timed entry museum tickets on our website. We hope to see you on Central Park West to view Notorious RBG in our Smith Gallery and cover story Catherine Graham, CEO, in our Joyce B. Cowan Women's History Gallery until October 24th. Thank you again and have a great night.